Okay, that's all we have. How about that video? Good evening again. I'm glad we could break bread together as a Husky family, and it's time to usher in our new and deserving members in the class of 2018 to the Husky Hall of Fame. In case you didn't know it, this uh, shrine really started in 1979. That first class had a who's who, kind of like tonight. Of course, they had 100 years worth of Husky sports to catch up. So that first class had the legendary names of Bob Hubricks, the All-American football players Chuck Carroll, and Hurry and Hugh McElhenney. There were coaches who took the University of Washington teams to the highest heights imaginable, Clarence Heck Edmondson, Gil Doby, Jim Owens. Ladies and gentlemen, this is truly an exceptional evening, and simply we are honoring the best of the best who wore the purple and the gold. And so, let's begin the show. That first Husky Hall of Fame class in 79 also featured larger-than-life figures in one of UW's most favorite athletic pursuits, rowing. Hiram Conabare, the Dower Dane, Al Ulbrichsen, and the boys in the boat, the 1936 Olympic champions. In Seattle, Washington, no place on earth cares more about crew racing. Am I right? This is Rowtown, USA. A lot of your current coaches make it mandatory reading. When the newbies come in to UW, you're reading Boys in the Boat by Dan Brown. How about we write another chapter in that, The Girls in the Boat. Collectively, these Varsity 8 rowers won back-to-back -back Pac-10 crowns and national championships, same years. They were the last in a string of five straight national titles for UW women. Three of the athletes went on to become coaches in rowing, one of them right here at her alma mater. So let's learn more about this extraordinary group of women, new Husky Hall of Fame inductees, the 1984 and 85 women's rowing team. The 84 and 85 teams were just dominant, and they were part of a dynasty. They were part of a dynasty that started in 1981 and ended pretty much in 1987. It's never been done before, and it's never been done again that they've won five national championships in a row. That tradition is very, very important, and to have pulled the North for University of Washington puts you in a very special club. To do it for a national championship is that just that much more elite. I'm just proud to have them as my as my sisters in that endeavor. By the time 84 and 85 had rolled around, there was a lot of competition on the women's side, and they still were able to win that national championship. Eleanor McIlvain, who was in that crew, I believe said that that was the best race of her life, and it had to be the best race of their life because the competition was so significant. Really important part of this story is that Washington rowing changed national rowing. So I was a freshman at the University of Wisconsin, and at this time, the women of Washington were already legendary. They were railing off national championships like they were going out of style. And all we were trying to do was figure out what could we possibly do to be able to compete with the University of Washington. Absolutely the team that was setting the standard nationwide as the model for how to go fast. They had women on those teams that to this day are some of the best rowers we've ever seen here. Bob Ernst took over the program in 1980 and 1981. He said, okay, women, this is what we do. And if you want to be champions, if you want to be champions, then this is what you're going to do. And the women bought into it, proving that women can do what men do. So 1985 was the first year that women raced 2,000 meters. 1,000 meters was essentially a sprint. But the reason women didn't race 2,000 meters initially was because they thought the distance was too far for them. Well, in 1984, Joan Benoit won the marathon for the United States, first time women were ever in the marathon. And I think everybody came around and realized in rowing that not only could women row 2,000 meters, but we could excel at 2,000 meters, just like our male counterparts. Washington rowing is like really the, the perfect microcosm or example of how successful Title IX has been. 
Because what Title IX did was it brought in the funding and the coaches and the facilities and made them equal. And it really informed who I was as an, as an athlete. These young women were just a hair behind me and had even more of the advantages of Title IX, but we still were working our way in. Whether we were in male-dominated professions, whether we were in you know, sales where we were really competing, that set the tone for our lives, and rowing prepared us for that. We're path setters and pathfinders, and many would say hopefully trailblazers. Not only were they great in their prime, but they're still involved with this program to this day. So I get to see most of them once a year at our alumni brunch and at various races throughout the year. They loved Washington rowing then, and they love it just as much now. And as a coach here, I'm so grateful to have them as a part of the story. George Pocock, he talked about how rowing and academics and being part of the community, all of those things, when you get to that level where you're succeeding at all of them, first of all, it takes a tremendous amount of work, but second of all, it's a wonderful feeling. And he used a quote from Browning where he said how fit to use all of the heart and the soul and the senses just for the joy of it. And I think that's what these women in 84 and 85 were able to achieve. Ladies and gentlemen, new inductees to the Husky Sports Hall of Fame, the University of Washington 1984 and 85 women's rowing teams. Speaking on their behalf, Chris Marie Campbell. Okay. Thank you so much. I don't know if 35 years ago any of us would have thought we'd be named Girls in the Boat, and we're incredibly honored, and we'd wind up here. And I think it all started with those alumni breakfasts that Yaz was talking about. We started to connect, and we were wondering, Washington Hall of Fame, what took you so long? <laughs> we're pretty old, you know. <laughs> and in this room today, these women have accomplished so much since we rode together in 84 and 85. Uh, the majority of these women are mothers. We have rowing coaches, including a collegiate coach, a national team coach, and a master's coach. We have a prosecuting attorney, a civil engineer, an environmental educator. We have uh, several presidents of their own company, an Olympian, a master gardener, someone who has lived internationally and personally saw the handoff of Hong Kong to China, someone who sailed around the world, a small airplane pilot and submarine pilot, a, um, a mountain bike guide, a river guide, an author, a hip hop dancer, and an actor. So these women are really awesome. <laughs> and when we showed up Washington, most of us had never been in a boat. I had never even really seen a boat. Now granted, they were athletes, I wasn't. When I was in high school, I was an elite flautist, which I thought was a little too competitive. And, and then I saw a made-for-TV movie that happened to be filmed right here at the University of Washington. It was a love story. She fell in love with him. He was a rower. It all looked so beautiful. And then I got a flyer that said, hey, if you're five foot eight or taller, come down to the shell house. Now, without heels, I'm a little over five six. But I didn't think they'd check. So along with 110 other women, I showed up at the Shell House the first day of classes. And then the novice coach, Jan Harville, walked up to another Hall of Famer, walked up to me and said, hey, do you want to be a coxswain? And I said, no, I want to row. <laughs> Without a word, she turned on a dime like I did not exist. So I was kind of wondering how this was going to go. And then I persisted. We all persisted. First, getting in shape, running around the soccer field once, twice, three times, learning how to row in the barge, being introduced to 6 a.m. practices, and getting on the water when the, most of, the rest of Seattle was probably asleep or just getting up. And if we had the joy of having good weather, 
it was, we could see the sunrise and Mount Rainier, and it was beautiful. And in the boat, we'd glide up, hear the thunk of the oarlocks, feel the weight of the water hit the blade, explode with our legs, swing open with our body, and finish strong, doing that over and over and over again, seeking perfection. And when we hit it, it was freaking magical and addictive. <laughs> Now, what I asked my peers, so what did you learn from rowing that actually kept you going all these years? And m many people said self-confidence. Self-confidence that I can actually do something that I didn't think I could do and push through. Even push through challenges. And it's the sense of friendship, trusting the journey. And what I learned from rowing was really the power of teamwork. And the X factor of teamwork. I make my living helping business people work together as teams, and what most people overlook is that X factor. You can have the same caliber of people, same horsepower in a team or a boat, but unless you trust and respect each other, unless you can believe you can win and visualize that success, unless you work together to make that happen, it ain't happening. And this was most exemplified through our Bob's ham and egg process. So every Friday, Bob would put our names in the hat and pick random lineups as a way of seeing who made boats go fast. And if you won, you got a gold star on, next to your name. Well, in 1985, I had a heck of a lot of go, gold stars. And the only difference I did that year was before we got in the boat, I took that random lineup and I said, you know, I know it looks like they can beat us. But if we pull together and swing together, we can win. And we did time and time again. It's the same strategy that the juniors that year implemented to beat the seniors, the mighty seniors in class day. I'll just say that. <laughs> now, um, these, you would think these two boats, and six of us are actually in both boats, you'd think, oh, that's pretty much the same. It wasn't. We had different coxswains, we had different coaches. You heard Yaz say we had different lengths of races, and we had different venues. In 1984, we had Bucko, that cute one on the end who's the, the tiniest one. <laughs> she is a force of nature. She has an opinion, she's gonna tell you it, and she's a bossy pants. <laughs> And because Bob was actually coaching the Olympic team in 84, we had John Squadroni as our coach. He's a really nice guy from Philly. And you know what? He lived in this floating shack right outside the boathouse. I don't know how, but he did. And as uh, you could always find him in his polo shirt. He was always really friendly, genuine nice guy. And when he was coaching us, he'd be in the launch, and we'd be rowing along, and he'd say, wah, 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 Chris. And I'd be wondering, what, what does he want me to change? And then he'd say, that's better. And I'd be like, okay, good. <laughs> and uh, that year we were undefeated. Three, three years before and that, that season we were undefeated. And the race was a sprint. It was 1,000 meters. So we could host nationals right here in Green Lake. Halfway through the race, we're behind Radcliffe in Wisco. But we pull through and we win. And because the race course is so short, we immediately had to put our oars in the water to stop so that we wouldn't run aground. It was a very fast, uh, wonderful uh, time to win in your hometown. Now in 85, we had Lynn as our coxswain. And Lynn, while she's a take charge, I think her dad must have been a bird watcher because we'd be doing these hard pieces and she'd say, okay, way enough, which is the rowing term to stop. She'd say, look at that blue heron on the buoy. How about that bald eagle flying by? And look at that beautiful sunrise. And uh, we had Bob, Bob was back, and I think we all have our unique relationship with Bob Ernst, and we can, we can agree he had his phrases that he would say. He was famous for cha-cha-cha, or full tilt boogie, or one of my favorites, give me curvature of the earth, which meant be as far, as far in front of your competitors that you can see the curvature of the earth. Now that year, they extended the race, like Yaz says, because they thought we wouldn't die if we raced 2,000 meters like the men, thank goodness. 
And uh, we started the season like we always did at the San Diego Crew Classic. And we lost. And Bob was so pissed. It was unheard of that Washington would lose. Granted, it was to the Canadian national team, but okay, we'll give you that. <laughs> and by the time we got to nationals, which were held in Virginia, we made sure we had curvature of the earth between us and any other competitor. Open water. <laughs> so in closing, I want to say it's such an honor to be with such amazing women <laughs> and be a part of this dynasty. And we're so honored to receive this award as the girls in the boat that we were and the amazing woman leaders that we've become. And we want to thank the University of Washington Hall of Fame for giving us this curvature of the earth, open water finish. Thank you. I bet if you got on an eight org tonight, you'd still have the swing, wouldn't you? Amazing group. Thank you for paving the way for others. A couple of months ago, one of my favorite sports, golf, I was watching the Ryder Cup and just Europe trashes the United States. And I'm thinking, why don't we get somebody who knows how to beat Great Britain and Europe for fun? That would be our next Husky Hall of Famer. He was a perfect 3-0 and o in Walker Cup matches against Great Britain, representing USA. The Yakima Valley produces a lot of great fruit, hops, cherries, wines, but also gave the University of Washington two tremendous golfers, happened to be siblings. One of them, an All-American, and he's still playing professionally, and he has an amazing story how he's still doing that as a livelihood and as something that's terribly fun in his life. Let's look on the career of another Husky Hall of Famer, Brock McKenzie. Being a Husky alum and having played four years on the golf team a long, long time ago, I've taken a, a strong interest in the golf team over the years. Watching Brock's performance and his leadership uh, was really special. I got a chance in Brock's first year to really coach him in that maturation process, coming from a superstar junior golfer and then growing into eventually a superstar uh, college golfer. And being able to go through those things with him was a joy for me as a coach. Odie got the program going in a huge way. After they finished fourth in 1999, going on this tour of Eastern Washington and recruiting Dan Potter and Corey Prue and Brock McKenzie and taking this fourth place trophy, Brock committed at that time and I got to come in right after he committed to coach him four years. Brock was the, really the first superstar, um, in my opinion, in the era of Husky Golf to choose to play for us. Well, the impact that he had, there's been other players that have come after him and have done amazing things too, but he was kind of the first. He's the reason so many others came behind. He validated the program, played in the Walker Cup, played in the Palmer Cup, and became four-time All-American, winning tournaments, playing all the biggest tournaments, known by all the best players, but it made it more acceptable for anybody to come to Washington and achieve big things. He really put us on the map, and he did it not just for one year, but four years. He is one of the most gifted ball strikers that I've ever been around in my life. I tell stories about Brock all the time still to my players. I learned a lot from him about how to play and how to get yourself ready to compete. Anytime he plays, he's gonna, gonna have a chance to, to win. He's just such a good golfer. One of the things that comes to mind is uh, Brock's performance uh, in the Walker Cup. Uh, the highest honor that an amateur golfer can receive is to play for the United States on the Walker Cup, which he did uh, over in Ireland. And uh, I was not able to attend, but I still have the tie that he sent me from that event. You know, I think the strongest feature in his golf game is that he's just incredibly accurate. Day after day, tournament after tournament, he's in the middle of the fairway, he's on the green. He and I always talk about a two iron hit on hole seven 
uh, at Stanford that just, he hit this shot into the par five. It was the most beautiful thing and he just looked up at me and I looked up at him and it had sounded differently and looked different than anything we'd ever seen and we both knew that that was a shot that, that was really special. It's funny that it's just one shot on one hole that he and I connected so much on talk about. I think it's significant that Brock continues to represent the UW as he plays on the PGA Tour and uh, I talk to him uh, frequently and he stays in touch with alums and uh, I think he frequently is wearing, wearing purple out there. Brock is more than deserving to be in the Hall of Fame. I also think that Brock is probably sharing this honor with his teammates um, that also brought so much with them, but that class as a whole was so significant to everything that, uh, that we built. Uh, but really Brock and, and the players that have followed him, I give, I give that class and Brock a lot of credit for being really the first people that believed in, in staying home and, uh, and, and building this program that's become such a powerhouse over the years. Congratulations, Brock, on your induction to the Husky Hall of Fame. A well-deserved honor. Ladies and gentlemen, bestowing the purple jacket on Brock McKenzie tonight is his father, Hugh McKenzie. I paid those guys a lot of money to say those nice things about me, so. Uh, plus, I also had to follow maybe the best public speaker I've ever heard. <laughs> My goodness gracious, who put me second? Um, also, I want to say I was on the field yesterday with the women's crew team, and they were amazing. I want to go party with you guys. You guys, <laughs> you guys were awesome. Um, God, man. Granted, I was three years old when you guys won all those national titles. <laughs> But you're still awesome. I'll go party with you after this. Uh, sorry, I'm a little nervous. The last time I uh, last time I spoke uh, last time I spoke uh, was actually a University of Washington uh, function. It was uh, I was the representative uh, for the athletes at uh, Barbara Hedges' uh, retirement uh, at the president's uh, universe of the university's home and. Uh, Granted, it's, it's been 15 years since then, so bear with me. Um, first of all, I want to say uh, congratulations to all the other honorees. Um, yeah. Uh, what a special class this is. Uh, you know, it's interesting for me, being a golfer, uh, I attended a bunch of basketball games, watching Brandon play. Uh, I watched Danielle play, Courtney. I wouldn't watch your games. For me, I'm a fan. So this is, this is really special for me to be honored with people that I have so much respect for. Uh, and this is a family. I mean, this really is. Uh, you know, I was, I was nervous and people were like, don't worry, everybody here is a Husky. You know, be comfortable. Uh, I, I play in front of thousands of people all the time and uh, but for some reason, I'm more nervous tonight than I am on the first tee when I was at the U.S. Open. So, uh, you know, that happens. Uh, anyways, my wife gave me one advice, uh, one piece of advice tonight. She says, uh, please don't take very long. I really want to hear what Brandon and Mark say. <laughs> Thanks, hon. So, um, that was the first time I'd seen those video clips. Uh, I chose those three guys uh, because they mean a lot to me. Uh, two of them were my coaches, Bruce Richards and Gail, uh, fully endowed my scholarship at the University of Washington. Um, I know there's a bunch of uh, donors and alumni here. Uh, you guys are the ones that really help make the athlete experience great at the University of Washington. We, we couldn't do some of the things without your support, whether it's financially or just Bruce asking me to go play Seattle Golf Club on a you know, Friday afternoon. Hopefully that's legal. I don't know, was that legal when you did that? I don't know. Nowadays with you know, booster stuff, I, don't, I just don't know. Um, I, I doubt they're looking into the golf program, worrying about the, you know, the NCAA really uh, investigating whether I played golf. But um, 
Anyways, uh, just a couple more thank yous. Uh, I want to thank, there's about three tables uh, of people here. Uh, former Husky golfers, um, donors, boosters uh, of UW golfers. I have uh, the Bancheros and the Rosori families uh, who basically adopted me. And, uh, and, you know, when I was in Seattle, my, my parents were in Yakima, but they'd have me over to their house on Sunday night dinners and feed me some good Italian food. As you can see from those pictures, I needed to eat a lot more, <laughs> and I have since. Uh, but uh, without, you know, without, without their support, they just made it a lot more comfortable here in Seattle. Um, let's see here. Uh, I, will, I will thank my sister. Um, hopefully she will be here one day with a purple blazer. She's always been a great support system for me. Um, she, uh, she gets to talk on the Golf Channel about three hours every morning, so I get five minutes to talk tonight to you, and this is my big night, and she gets to talk about golf for three hours every day, so that doesn't seem fair to me either. This is, this is supposed to be my night, and I follow the best public speaker. My sister's here. Everybody's shaking her hand tonight. Nobody knows who I am. This is really, this isn't going how I expected. <laughs> um, I have to thank my wife because of all, everyone that here that's married, if, if I didn't thank my wife, I'd be in a lot of trouble. Um, the weird thing about that is my wife was in seventh grade when I was, in uni when I was at a University of Washington, which... It doesn't sound as creepy as I just said that. She's, she's only seven years younger than me, and I'm 37 now, so it doesn't sound as creepy, but um, I still I want to thank her for her support. Being a pro golfer, I'm, a, I'm gone 30 weeks a year, and she's great. Um, thank you. The final two people I'd like to thank uh, they both graduated uh, Washington State University. Uh, they were both there for seven years, which if this was in Pullman, they'd probably get a standing ovation for getting done so fast. <laughs> to, to their credit, it took them four years in undergrad and then they both uh, did pharmacy school for three years. So they. They really overperformed for Wazoo grads, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, and that, that brings me up to the, I'm almost done, I promise. Um, <laughs> oh man, this is, this is I, I'm gonna be nice. Um, they, uh, you know, people ask me all the time, uh, your parents both went to Wazoo, all your family went to Wazoo. Why didn't you go to Wazoo? And uh, I tell them, you know, as a parent, you always want better for your children. <laughs> and I think it's safe to say that Paige and I fulfilled that. I'm done. Thank you, everyone. Congrats, everyone. Thank you. He'll be at uh, Giggles on Roosevelt Friday night. By the way, that gentleman shot a 60 at Eugene Country Club once upon a time. Proof again that Huskies can do great things in Oregon Duck Country. I remember the women's golf championship was held there that UW won. Hmm. You're going to hear a common story tonight from our inductees. They played for something bigger than themselves, their school and in some cases for their country. Our next former UW athlete already has her jersey up there, number three. As a kid in Southeast King County, her brother used to reward her for tremendous sports accomplishments by taking her to Dairy Queen to get a blizzard. But it kind of worked out, it's a good incentive. She became the engine room, the fierce leader of the University of Washington's only NCAA championship volleyball team. Let's look back on the sensational career now of our next Hall of Fame inductee, Courtney Thompson. I love Courtney Thompson's story. It's a story of hope, and it's one that I love to tell. 
being recruited, a lot of college coaches told her she couldn't do it at this level. She was too little. Courtney chose not to believe that. She was never going to let anyone outwork her and someone who just gave her all in everything that she did. Her ability to lead a group of women and get them to believe in the goal and get them to follow her is unmatched. We did the things that we did here at University of Washington and we accomplished the goals that we accomplished because of her and because of her leadership, hands down. It started from day one and how she lived her life. She wanted to be great in everything that she did. Each day that she came into the gym, she was not only mentally prepared, but she was physically prepared and ready to go. She was the reason that our team was able to create this environment and atmosphere where we all worked for each other and worked towards one goal. And she led that all. She just brought this drive and this attitude, she was relentless about being great, and she brought that every single day. It was such an honor to play beside her, and um, she just brought some qualities that I haven't seen from a lot of people. It's hard for me to put into words how great of a leader she is, because she's one of the best that you could ever imagine. You know, before we went to the NCAA tournament, we lost to UCLA and it helped refocus the team. There was a mantra that went into NCAA tournament that was, no one's gonna get in our way. She made sure that we were focused, we were prepared like we were every day and before every game. Being able to play alongside Court in the same position and just compete against her was amazing. It was such a benefit to our team that she was that person for us. Just that consistency was huge for that season. In my eyes, I think her legacy has little to do with the championships and the awards and those recognitions. To me, it was what she brought every single day. To make those around her better, I think that's, that's her legacy and what stands out more. So many people get caught up and worry about things that they can't control, and that wasn't Courtney. She said, I can do this thing, and I'm gonna do it by working hard, and I'm gonna become the best that I can be. We'll let the chips fall. But she was not gonna let anyone or any person stop her from becoming the player and the person that she wanted to be. And because of that, she now gives hope to so many young players in the Washington community and nationwide that if you put your mind to something, you can do anything you want. With just a little bit of hard work, you can become what you want to become. Maybe you don't reach your goal, but you know you did your best to get where you want to be. And that's Courtney's story. She just wanted to be the best, and she did everything she possibly could to be the best that she can be. I think that people need to understand how amazing she is, both on and off the court, because nobody compares. And I don't think anybody ever will. Ladies and gentlemen, bestowing the purple jacks, uh, jacket on our Hall of Famer, Courtney Thompson, two of her teammates, Crystal Morrison Engel and Tamari Miyashiro. It's a good start already. I, first of all, I want to congratulate um, Brock on his new stand-up comedian career. <laughs> that was awesome. Uh, yeah, this is so incredible. I've been I've been really emotional today, which is rare for me. And this is I'm just really grateful. You know, I grew up in Kent, an hour away, as this kid that was undersized, and um, I grew up with two older brothers that and wanted to be them. They were my heroes and just loved to compete. And we used to get ready for Little League games in my family. We'd like lay out our uniform and I just remember driving in the car with my parents and thinking, and they would say, hey, isn't this great? Aren't we so lucky to be able to get to compete today and we're in our uniforms with our team? Like, this is amazing. And getting to compete in college, uh, much less anything that has happened after that has been such a bonus for my family and I. Uh, this is just a huge honor. And, you know, I played, I played 10 years overseas after competing at the University of Washington. And community has always meant a lot to me, but it means even more once you're not in it for a long time. And to come back 
after a lot of failure, to come back after a lot of success, and to be treated the same way by everybody here that is family at the University of Washington means more to me than anything that I could articulate tonight. So thank you for letting me, me be a part of this family. And my family gave me this great gift. I think that they taught me from a young age that it's not always what we accomplish, but what we get those around us to accomplish that can be most meaningful. And that's the, really the reason I wanted to be a part of the University of Washington, is that family and community, and we, we love to win championships here. That's what's up. Hey, oh, we all love that, you know? Winning's way more fun than losing. Uh, but there's also a standard of how we go about that, and that's rare and it's unique. And it's classy, and there's a level of respect. And it wasn't just our coaching staff that modeled that for me. I think Jim McLaughlin was the first, guy, first coach in our country to say, Court, I don't care how tall you are. You don't have to be tall to be great. I just need you to be really good, and you will be as good as you want to be in this program. And I looked him in the eye, I was like, I want to win four national titles. And he didn't tell me that was impossible. He said, hey, we got a lot of work to do, so let's go. And Tui, I, I think, when I think of uh, Tui, it's hard not to talk about her without getting emotional, but someone that has set the standard in our program for integrity, for hard work, what it means to be a classy woman that's really competitive. Thank you, there's a lot of us in the room tonight and you set the standard and I aspire to be like you every single day, too. So thank you for what you've meant to this program. And our, our coaching staff was amazing. And Keegan, who I didn't play for, is also an amazing guy who's made me feel welcome every time I come home. Uh, Tamari and I started a nonprofit. This is my, one of my favorite stories about Keegan in 2014. And we're like super grassroots. So we get like a $5 donation and we're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. The first uh, personal check that we got was from Keegan Cook with a note that said, we're so proud you're Huskies, we're here for you, we support what you're doing, thank you. And Keegan, that, that just speaks volumes to who you are, and I'm, I'm grateful you're here as a coach, and thank you so much for making me feel so welcome. But I also really like that at UW, it was just this family environment where we supported people for who they were and we challenged them to be better, and I think of times uh, before our Final Four, coming down here and Romar stopping me and saying, hey, do you know what it's like when you win a national title? Like, you get to impact so many people, and your team will never forget that. And, and those kind of conversations that are the catalyst to just wanting to be a better version of yourself. And I think of times in the weight room. I was a little bit OCD when I competed in college, and uh, I used to work out before school every day. And I'd be riding the bike, warming up, and Coach Hart, Randy Hart, would always warm up in the bike next to me, like 6 a.m. I don't think he's here tonight, but he's been a huge part of my life, and I don't think he even knows it. And we would have these conversations at 6 a.m. every day. And at one, maybe a few months into this, I remember him looking at me and saying, Courtney, I like you. Please don't date any of my linemen. <laughs> I really, just do whatever, just don't do that, all right. So fast forward six years, I leave UW, and I'm, I'm on the USA team, and I got cut from the 2008 Olympic team. And so I kind of thought that was it for me. I had a you know, fun career here and above and beyond, and I was in the weight room again, warming up, kind of working out, and he was like, hey, what are you doing? You know, how are things going? And I said, well, I got cut. Like, I, I think I'm going to be done. It's been a great career. And he stopped, and he just looked at me, and he said, don't you give up now. The rest of us won't know what to do. And obviously, everybody knows what to do, but... You know, it's those moments as a community that I don't know that you always, you never know what one line is going to stick with somebody. And the next 10 years competing on the USA team to be my best, it was hard. There's ups and downs. And, I, and those kind of comments meant a lot to me. And I took UW with me everywhere. In fact, I got in trouble on the USA team because I wore UW sweats all the time. Like, hey, do you need more gear? Or are you? Yeah, I just love it. My favorite question was, hey, where did you play in college? Because it's different here. There's a standard of of excellence and family and community that I am so grateful to be a part of. Uh, Jen, I, I, I'm so grateful for you and what you've created here and continue to create. It makes me want to be better. And I also want to thank uh, my family. This has been, uh, I don't know, my whole career has been so surreal for us. And I want to thank Dad. I want to thank you for just being such a dreamer, you know, and always uh, keeping this great perspective of why not you? 
you know, and, and for a lot of us women, I think to have male role models in our lives that not only tolerate our competitiveness and our edginess, but celebrate it. And someone that has told me to never apologize for being who I was. So thank you, Dad, for that. Uh, Mom, you've been my first phone call my entire life. You've been my best friend, uh, my favorite person, and someone that I want to be like every single day. So thank you. My oldest brother, Craig, went to UW. He stayed close, and he came to every single one of my high school basketball games. He coached me when I was younger, and I only got a blizzard, to be fair, if I had more assists than points. <laughs> and, and he's the first one that took me in the driveway and said, hey, you can't quit if you don't make 10 out of 10 layups. Like, you got to stay in here. And so when I think of work ethic and heart and leadership, Craig, I think of you. I love you, and you've been my hero my whole life, so thank you. And, and Trevor, you've kind of been my person my whole life, someone that always keeps me on my toes, that I argue with more than anybody. Um, but thank you for everything you've meant, and you make me want to be better every single day. And I'm so grateful to be a part of our family. And I hope someday, this is not a loaded statement, Chase, uh, but I hope my name changes at some point. <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> I was not loaded. I'm in no hurry. I'm just saying. But there, there's something really special to me that, that our name, that the Thompson, that your name uh, is going to be in these rafters and in this Hall of Fame forever. And for us coming from Kent, this is so special and I'm so grateful. And lastly, I just want to thank my teammates. Uh, you guys, not everyone's here tonight, but my job literally was to be the middleman. And I can't do it without a pass and a kill. And uh, Crystal and... Farney and Tama, you guys mean the world to me. Bree Dub is here tonight. I love you. She's my roommate. You guys mean the world to me. And uh, Chase, he's my boyfriend that I just threw under the bus. <laughs> I've had a lot of fun in the first 32 years of my life, and none ha nothing has been as fun as the last year with you. So thank you for loving me for who I am. For all the competitive women, I don't think we're high maintenance, but I wouldn't say we're easy to date all the time. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, to the Lamros and the Taylors that are here, thank you so much. This means the world to me, and the only way I know how to honor this is to really try to give back in any way I can, and I'm grateful that you guys want me here forever because I don't want to go anywhere either, so thank you. I was kind of hoping we'd make Hall of Fame history and have a proposal tonight. <laughs> no, this is not The Bachelorette. Okay. Thank you, Courtney. And good luck. You know, by the way, she's the woman who's energizing Pete Carroll, working for his company right now, his foundation. That's a good match. One of my favorite group of Huskies to cover was the 2000 football team which overcame so many challenges and willed themselves to victory after amazing victory, including defeating Drew Brees and the Purdue Boilermakers in the Rose Bowl. Of all the talented players on that football team, and Tui was one of them, only one earned first team All-America honors. He came from the heart of Cougar country in little Finley, Washington in the Tri-Cities. This big blocker decided though to be a dog and aren't we all glad he did. Time to see more about the great career of our new Husky Hall of Famer inductee, Chad Ward. My first impression of Chad is just how enormous he is. Obviously, I'm not a small human, but Chad is a big human. And there's all this bright orange hair coming at you, and pale skin, and uh, a big smile. I want to say seventh grade, might have been eighth grade, you're talking 6'2", 250, 260. And then when he played baseball for me to see how he could run and jump, you know, he had a 30-inch vertical, and he's 300 pounds. When I started seeing him lift and uh, the size he had, the feet he had, I said, my gosh, this guy can probably play wherever he wants. Well, one, he's a big man, and he was powerful, and he was really smart, 
and he was really competitive and he was really determined. And he put all those things together, he could learn the game, he wanted to be really good at the game. He became a great player. He was a great guy to coach and it's, it's my belief that he was a great, great teammate. When I came back here in 1999, Chad and his group was already here. And there were people who said, you're not gonna have a very good offensive line. Well, the first guy I see is Chad Ward, and then Elliot Silvers and Kyle Bennett, and Rock Nelson and Dom Doste and Matt Fraze. And I looked at those kids and I said, you know, I think we're gonna be better than everybody thinks. And they went on to be a great offensive line. The Rose Bowl year and the Rose Bowl game, Chad was a huge integral part. That offensive line was a whole group. We had a bunch of strong personalities, and he was just one of them who helped lead a position group that really led the team, in my opinion. The way he played, the stuff he did in the weight room. And I think the Rose Bowl team needed somebody who not necessarily was a loud vocal piece, but someone who could lead by example. It was really a big part in, in teaching the guys below him for years to come how to be a leader and how to be a Husky. He was relentless about getting better, he was relentless about winning. You know, he, he had the mental side. I always refer to it as brain one. You know, you coach so many kids through the years and you finally get one that you only have to tell something to one time. Even though he played guard for me, he could step in and play tackle, he could move to the other side of the ball, he could play center. He just uh, tuned in to everything that was going on. There was a game, this running back breaks through and he's gone. I mean, I'm standing there on the sidelines, I don't have the best view in the world, but uh, all of a sudden there's number 71, starts running. And by gosh, he runs this guy down before he crosses the goal line. Funny part about the story is after the game, the coach came over and said, he just want to tell you that uh, Chad ran down the fastest guy on my team. He was never afraid of hard work. I was coaching at the Seahawks in 2005, and we had a defensive lineman who had played for Purdue against us in the Rose Bowl. One day he said to me, he said, Coach, you guys had a really good offensive line. He said, but man, who was that big guard? So I told him, his name was Chad Ward. Why? He goes, that guy pounded on me and wore me out. And that's the kind of player Chad was. He makes the decision to go to the UW, and all of a sudden I get this phone call from Chad. It's the fourth game of his uh, freshman year, true freshman year, even though he was a gray shirt. He says, he says, Coach, I'm starting. Starting at home against Nebraska. Nebraska was the early 90s. I mean, they, they were one of, the, one of the teams. And I said, well, congratulations. And he never missed a start from then, the rest of his career, from then on. I'm proud of him. Chad Ward, congratulations on your induction to the Husky Hall of Fame. I know the guy in that video. Here to bestow the purple jacket on our inductee, Chad Ward, is his former head coach and offensive line coach, Keith Gilbertson. I look great, but it's on right. So I'll apologize from the start if I get a little emotional on my video because my high school coach who passed away last Friday, his funeral is actually happening right now. And uh, so I'll be able to get through it, but I might quiver a little bit. Um, so yeah, I talked about Eastern Washington and, and the Pullman and, and living in that country. And um, when I was a high school kid, Mike Price called me and he said, hey, I want to you come over for a visit. And I told him that I'd already seen wheat fields before, and I didn't know that getting drunk while looking at wheat fields would make a difference. So um, I passed on the trip and um, did what I was, was told that you want to do. If you're going to play college football, you should win the Rose Bowl. And um, then I looked up and said, well, who does that? And it's the University of Washington. So that's why I came here. And, I wasn't a kid who watched football every day, but I knew that if you, if you played, this is what you should want to do. And I didn't really, when I made that decision, I didn't really know what that meant and how quite awesome that would be, but it ended up being um, a lifetime memory. Um, so I had a couple great men in my life. My father, who's not here with us, um, who would, I'm sure would be very proud of me, and uh, he would say one word, wow. He was a man of few words. 
no matter what you got him for Christmas, he'd say, wow. Um, so, wow, thanks, Dad. Um, and then Coach Everson, whom you heard speak on the, on the, uh, on the video, uh, who was a, just one of those great coaches that gets in your life and it has a positive impact on you that you want to impress and that you would do anything for him. And he's one of those great guys. And then Coach Gilbertson, another one who just, you know, there's coaches, you know, they want you to succeed. And there's coaches that will push you to succeed. But then there's coaches that you know and you feel like they love you and they, that you have to succeed. And they're not going to quit until you do. And they're not going to let you quit. And so those are those guys that just had an impact. Um, another impact Coach Gilbertson had on me was we were in the sideline one time, and he pointed up, and he said, you know why I'm pointing up like this? I said, no, and he said, so the crowd doesn't see me do this, and he kicked me in the shin. Uh, and he said, you need to stop doing it your way and start doing it my way like I taught you. And so as I winced in pain, I realized that was a pretty good trick. 80,000 people, nobody saw it. Uh, and he didn't kick me that hard. Hard enough to, to wake up and start doing it his way. Um, but yeah, and then I got to hear Dom Dasty say some kind words about my pale skin, uh, which is good. I do have pale, pale skin. Um, that picture, I was standing on a bench, so I wasn't that much taller than everyone out of Finley. There, there's radiation in Tri-Cities from, you know, Hanford, but it's not that, it's not that powerful. Uh, but yeah, they had me on a bench, and I think the headline was The Freak of Finley, which my mother took offense to. Um, there was a Javon Kirst player at that time who was nicknamed The Freak, so it was meant as a compliment, but... She didn't receive it that way, which I understand as a mother. Uh, we did not like her son being called a freak, even though it was a good thing. Um, and I guess now would be a good time to thank her and my family. Um, the boys very supportive and you know, went to all my games, never missed anything. Always were there supporting me and, and arranging you know, everything for football, just as football families do. You know, you're having funerals, let's move it to Tuesday so the guy can make the game. And you know, that's, that's what you do, you football family. It's, it's uh, part of the deal, and, and it's, at the time, you're like, why are we doing this on a Wednesday? But, you know, and you realize, well, because games are on Saturday. And, um, so, yeah, everybody gives up a certain amount of stuff for you when you're an athlete that you don't, you're not aware of when you're a child and you're maturing, and then you become an adult and you have a child, and you realize the things that they give up for you and how much they love you, and it impacts you greatly. Um, and you become, I think, humbled and more appreciative as you get older. Um, and you just hopefully your parents are around long enough so you can give that appreciation back to them. Um, and so it's a big deal. And yeah, the, the bond that we form with the teammates here at University of Washington, I think, you know, you can hear that theme and everyone's talking. It's true um, that, that shared experience, and I think our shared experience is special and it's different. I remember that first year after the first, with all the guys who recruits from California, when they were going home that first time, they were all so excited to go home, playing California, you know, all these songs and they're so excited to go home and see their family and that wanes a little bit they still miss home but that that how much they miss it you can see as the seniors you know they were excited to come back to the group and it's a different feeling because when they were they were all pumped to leave me and go back home I was like why are you guys so excited to go home you know I'm here and so yeah it's just and then their senior year nobody you know everybody's kind of trying to hang around as long as they can it's stay here as long as you can because you don't want to let it go because the real world starts, right? And uh, so if you can hang out here longer, it's better. And I think, um, and I'll kind of wrap it up while I'm, since I made it this far without crying. Um, I'll maybe draw a tear here, but um, so after I found out I was being inducted to the Washington, University of Washington Hall of Fame, and it was kind of surreal for me because I never, maybe I was too humble or I'm not sure, maybe I didn't think about it, but I just didn't see myself as a, a Mark Brunel or my name next to his. and these types of guys that, I've, that I grew up idolizing, it just didn't, just didn't fit or didn't seem like I'd earned it, but I'll take it. Uh, but you know, and, but we're in the car with my son, he's six and a half, and he and I listened to Macklemore a lot, and he said, it, 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 almost I only had to pull the car over. There was, he goes, Dad, it's like that Macklemore song. And he said, well, you die twice, once when they put you in the ground, and the second one, when no one remembers your name. He's like, you'll never die twice now. They'll always remember your name. And I thought, you know, I was like, Oh, that kid really listens to his music. Um, and so for him to first understand what that meant was a pretty big deal. And then to put that to me, I had to tell him to shut up so I could stop crying and uh, continue to drive the car. But so those, that put it in perspective for me. I was like, okay, you're right. Um, at least a certain group of really awesome people will always remember my name. And so um, I'd like to thank everybody and uh, the co-dogs.
We'll remember your name, Chad Ward, when you're doing the comedy circuit with Brock McKenzie. Congratulations. And we need your coat back. They need some more draping up here at Heck Ed tonight. Just kidding. Thank you for coming by the tailgate show yesterday and making Gilby and me look good. Long before the Seattle Storm won their third WNBA title, years before Chantel and Kelsey took Husky basketball to the promised land of the Final Four, women's hoops was a huge deal in this building and the city of Seattle. Still is today. I had the good fortune of being the first radio play-by-play -play announcer for Husky women's basketball 1989-90 season. They were a team of tough-minded young women who also had the passion and determination that their head coach exemplified, and they reached the NC Tournament Elite Eight in that year. Washington against Stanford was a war and a must-see social event in this building. It was electric. Front page news. The coach is still teaching the game, still mentoring young women to set the bar high on the court and in life. Let's look at the fabulous career of our next Husky Hall of Fame inductee, Coach Chris Gobrecht. So when you think back to the Chris Gobrecht era, 1985 to 96, you can't help but think of some of the incredible talent that came through the program at that time. Tracy Thirdgill, Jackie Myers, Amy Mickelson, Karen Deedon, Lori Merlino, Rhonda Smith, and those players, those, those teams represent an incredible era in Husky women's basketball. You could argue pretty easily that the Goldbreck era really put the University of Washington women's basketball on the map both locally and regionally. Um, Seattle really became a hotbed for uh, women's basketball and I think you see that even today. She was a demanding coach that demanded that girls play man-to-man -man defense, uh, deny the ball defense that players may have not particularly liked it because of its intensity, but it attracted fans. And covering that team, seeing it become a part of the Seattle sports scene the way it did was, was pretty fun to cover. And her philosophy and how she conducted herself on and off the court, she held us to a higher standard. She had expectations of who we were going to be as humans and who we were going to be as athletes and as students. It didn't waver. Like, she was the same person on the court as she was off the court. She works really closely cultivating relationships with the media, cultivating relationships with the community, with donors, with fans. I mean, we credit her today here in the department as putting together one of our first ever team support groups, a group that we still lovingly call the Fast Break Club, our Fast Breakers. She understood that it wasn't just coaching, but she needed to really create a community that loved women's basketball. She would tell us things that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Uh, God's never gonna give you something uh, that he doesn't think you can handle. Uh, and on the court, really it was just her level of intensity and her demand that we work as hard as we could. It was always in tight games that she'd pull off the quote that you were like, oh, I can't believe you just said that. But one time she was really, really mad at us. And she said, if what unites you as a team is hating me, then I'm doing my job. And she would get so angry that she would go out on the court. I don't know how many technicals she actually got, but she would go out on the court and Coach A, her assistant, Coach Kathy Anderson, would hold her skirt if she was wearing a skirt or hold the tip of her jacket. So there are probably pictures in the archive somewhere of her, you know, standing as far out of the coach's box as she could and her skirt being stretched. Uh, because Coach A was holding the point of her skirt, basically saying you can't go any further. You know, she was the coach here during her late 20s and early 30s with two small children at home and Eric and Maddie and just the community around you that has to make, um, make everything possible. I think about Kathy Anderson, her longtime assistant coach, but I also think about Chris's husband, Bob. He was a 
a fixture in and of himself here in Seattle with a long time background in sports marketing and then went on to do some incredible things with the Special Olympics. It takes a, it takes a village, it takes a lot of people in your life to achieve all that she achieved here. So not only is this obviously an award for her, but I think the, the greater community that kind of made it all possible. Coach G, congrats on being inducted to the Husky Hall of Fame. And here to bestow that purple jacket on our Hall of Famer, Chris Gobrecht, is her former assistant coach, Kathy Anderson. Those two guys were so funny that I'm not quite sure where to begin. I'm right with you, Jen, on the voice issue. I'm having a problem, too. And it was because, not because I yelled at a football game, but because I'm still a basketball coach. And when you get a little bug and you're a basketball coach, this is what happens, especially since I continue to be very calm, very, <laughs> very quiet. And and so my week of being very calm and very quiet with my cadets at the Air Force Academy, who, a team that has nine freshmen, uh, did a number on my voice, so. But anyways, listen, just seeing all my players here today, that is the thing that I will remember the most about this day. I just can't even tell you all how much it means to me to have you here and just, to see you and see how successful you've been in your lives and how special that time was that we had. And there, I don't know how you distill 11 years of probably the most significant times and moments and, and successes in my life into, a, into five minutes. I just don't think it can be done. Um, but what happened here, I mean, how do you say one name without saying every name? How, how do you ever thank the people that were such a big part of that support crew and that made it possible for me to be raising small children and, and coaching this top 20 basketball team. And, and I couldn't have done it without Kathy and, and without Willette White, who's also here, and, and Cheryl Parker, our trainer, and Cindy Fester, our sports information director. And, and to see the Blethens here, Frank and Charlene Blethen, they were, they were some of the original you know, people in Seattle who believed in what we were doing. But I would love to tell you there was a plan, and there was a plan for how it was supposed to happen, but there wasn't a plan. I was too young and I was too clueless. It was just simply, I think, God putting the right people together at the right time in the right place. And this is a very, very unique environment for women's sports. This is a, this is a professional sports city and you do not see women's sports succeed in a professional sports city anywhere but Seattle. And, <clears throat> it's, it's partly because of a very socially progressive environment, it's partly because of being so many people from the University of Washington who stay in this area and stay connected with the university and um, I had no idea at the time. I just, I, I came and I was really excited I was going to get to coach at a university of something, you know. And at the time, that was, that was all I knew. Um, and what I found was unbelievable. To this day, I, I think back on it and I go, I can't believe this happened. You know, I, when I got there my very first year, there was, I looked out at that team and, and it included Yvette Cole. And congratulations, Yvette, on you being in the Hall of Fame. I wish I, I wish I could have been there. I should have, I should have been there, and I'm sorry I wasn't. But you, you know, I looked out, and she was the only freshman on the team, and there was the Lisas, Lisa Rashkow, Lisa Oriard, um, and they did some amazing things. And 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 a another young woman who who was here tonight that I just I'm so excited to see because she was one of the all-time great people I ever got to be around. Eileen McManus and. Just, we were, we were able to, you know, go out and, and 
I remember, I remember games. I don't remember, you know, specifically winning or losing. I just remember the, the, the excitement of whatever it was we were doing. And we beat, I remember beating Oregon in that little Cracker Jack gym to win the, our first conference title. And, 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 there was, and the place was packed and the, and the walls were perspiring because there were so many people in there and going so crazy. And, and then we went on to play Louisiana Tech, who at the time was the, the real juggernaut in women's basketball, and there was Lisa Rashkout going, trying to trying to keep up with Teresa Witherspoon, and 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 they had this, and they had this center who was like the you know the aircraft carrier size, and she was in the middle of the key, and and I, I know Lisa was looking for Yvette, and she was looking for Oriard, and she was looking for Eileen, but she could not see them, and so so it was kind of a long night, and then you know. And then we just it just kept kept getting better and better, and then sort of the next generation came along with Jackie Myers and and Amy Mickelson uh, and Tracy Thirdgill, and they they were sort of that foundation. And then we added those those two really great pieces of of Lori Merlino and Karen Deeden. And and Karen, congratulations to you too for being in the Hall of Fame because I and again I wish I could have been there. I just, because I, I still to this day tell people Karen was might be the, the best all-around player I ever coached. And it was, uh, and you know, we'll never, we're never gonna forget uh, that, that game. We all know that game in 1990 against Stanford. And uh, <laughs> that, was sort of, that was sort of when women's basketball arrived in this city and it was sold out and, and we um, managed to have the grudge match against Stanford. And for the record, I still hate them. And, <laughs> So, the, but we pulled that off cause, because Deedon and Merlino went off and, and Tara Vanderveer to this day can't figure out how to stop Amy Mickelson and, and Jackie Myers went toe to toe with Jennifer Az and Tracy Thirdgill made Katie Stedding, well, I'll be polite. She made her need to use the restroom. And <laughs> so that, that win was, you know, that was incredible. And then, of course, the next year, we go up to Stanford, and Stanford had a 68-game home win streak going on at the time. And we're down one and seconds left in the game, and we set up a play for Karen Deedon, and she misses, which was rare, but she did miss this time. And, and uh, Diane Williams uh, dives onto the floor, tips the ball out to Laura Moore, and the amazing part about this story is that Laura Moore had not played a second of the game. And I put her in at the very end because she was our best shooter and we needed a score and so it kind of made sense to me. But so Diane Williams dives on the floor and pushes this ball out to Laura Moore. Laura Moore picks it up, buries it from deep and we end up beating Stanford and, and uh, breaking their 68 game home win streak. And so, of course you remember those kinds of things. <laughs> and, and then sort of the next generation came that, in, that included Shannon Kelly and, and uh, Tara Davis and, and, the, uh, and, and of course Rhonda Smith who, and Rhonda congratulations to you and I should have been there for you too. <laughs> Rhonda, to this day, the most entertaining player that I've ever coached. <laughs> Rhonda could make, Rhonda could, was the only one that could make me laugh, and they all knew it. And so when they knew I was in a really bad mood, they'd send Rhonda my direction and try to soften me up. And, and, and I had, there were so many great memories from, from those years, too. And, and, and one of the, the big ones there was the preseason NIT, winning the inaugural preseason NIT in Lubbock, Texas, when Rhonda went off for, I don't know, 43, something like that. I mean, she had some amazing number of points. And, and it was very hard to leave the, the freshman class that I had to, had to leave when I did leave. And, and that one in, in, included Jamie Red, Molly Hills. Um, I had coached Molly's older sister, Heidi Hills, both of them still married to Husky football players and purple and gold through and through and just all of you, I just hope you know how much I recognize how incredible you were 
and that you were the reason any of this happened. It, 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 it was, yes, we had good time, at, but you were, you guys appreciated the fan support, but it never went to your heads, you know? You stayed humble. You stayed extremely hardworking. You continued to buy in, and you continued to just do whatever your crazy coach told you to do. And I don't, I think sometimes you have to, as, as it is with anything, you have to step away to really realize how special the people were that you had in your life at that time. Um, but through it all, you saw my family up on that screen, and that was the constant. And my family is the most important thing to me. And it was, it was my rock. They always have been. I am so proud. I am so proud of my children. And they're here tonight. My son, who was the little, you know, you remember his little toddler grabbing at my skirt. And he went on to graduate from the Air Force Academy and is now uh, flying one of the most sophisticated aircraft in the world. Uh, for our nation, and my son Eric. Um, he's here with his wife, Catherine, who's a very accomplished journalist for uh, DevEx International, and my daughter, Madeline, um, who was just the little girl with the curls, you know, sitting, sitting down there and taking it all in, and she grew up to be probably the best Best, one of the best players I ever coached at Yale, and uh, is married to Greg Moviel, who, who, this is a great small world story. He's, he's a successful businessman himself, but prior to that, he was actually drafted by the Seattle Mariners and played in their uh, minor league program and drafted out of Vanderbilt. For, so, and then of course, they have the, uh, the light of my life right now, my, my grandson, Mac, um, which is a good thing that he's here, because if he wasn't here, I probably would have spent this entire five minutes making you watch a PowerPoint presentation <laughs> of my grandson. So, and I'm, and I'm also just so grateful that my parents are here, uh, Bill and Adrienne Geiger, that they could be here, and that they, you know, I had a dad who was a real sports nut, but he never once told me how to coach. That's, that's pretty nice. And, and my mom, who it took her a while to figure out what I did, but when she saw me on ESPN, <laughs> she was, she figured it might, it's probably a pretty big deal. And so, and they, they watched every game they could possibly get to, so. And then there's somebody that's not here, and that's my amazing, amazing husband. Um, my husband, Bob Gobrek, was a fixture in Seattle himself. He was, um, he ran Seafair for five years. He was also a vice president with the Seattle Mariners. He was just a, a, a lot of people, everybody knew Bob. My teams always liked my husband more than me. And he was, because he, he was so much fun. He was, he is so much fun. And he's so giving and he's so supportive and he's the kind of person that no matter who you are or what, what you're doing, you're going to, he's going to make you feel better about it. And he's not here because he's, he's, he's very, very ill. And I, he's so ill that I probably shouldn't be here. But that's, that tells you who he is. He wouldn't have it any other way. And I am deeply indebted to him as, as, and just love him with all my heart. And it just makes me sad he can't enjoy this because... He, he, was, he was the reason any of this ever happened for me. He was the reason I got into coaching. He was the reason that we came to Washington. And three years ago, he was extremely sick, and he still said, listen, the Air Force Academy, they want you, they need you. Let's go, let's go help that program build. And, um, and I guess it's only fitting now that it's okay for me to come back and still be a coach someplace else because I'm coaching at a place that is, belongs to all of us. It doesn't, it wasn't hard for me to cheer for the Huskies yesterday against Colorado, even though I live in Colorado, because the, my school doesn't belong to Colorado. It belongs to all of you. It belongs to everybody. And, and we are all, I hope that when you don't cheer for the Huskies, that you cheer for the Air Force Academy. So I'm, so I'm, I'm enjoying that tremendously. But 
I can't thank you enough for what this time meant to me. And as I said, my players, you have just made my heart just burst with gratitude. And I love you very much, and I thank you for all the wonderful things that you helped make happen in my life and my family's life. So, thank you. All that's missing is the Husky Pep Band with a little rendition of Hey Baby for your new grandson, perhaps. Buddy Horton and Violet Palmer declined an invitation to come tonight to referees. They were afraid they might issue technical fouls on coach. I'm often asked by my neighbors, do you think the NBA will ever come back to Seattle? Yeah. Maybe, doesn't sound like it, but if we were to get the Sonics or a reasonable facsimile, I would want our next Hall of Famer to be involved with it somehow, some way. He is one of the great Seattle basketball players ever. He's one of the greatest ever here at the University of Washington. And in my opinion, he was a second coach on the floor. He made everybody else around him better when number three was out there. Another jersey retired here in the Heckhead Rafters. Humble beginnings, he earned his way to the Pac-10 Player of the Year, consensus All-American, then with the Portland Trailblazers Rookie of the Year and a three-time NBA All-Star. Let's look back on the outstanding career of our next Husky Hall of Famer, Brandon Roy. There have been so many players to come out of the Seattle area that have been successful. But Brandon was just different in that he, he was the local kid that stayed home. In high school, we had seven to eight Division I guys on our team. As a sophomore, Brandon swung and went junior varsity, varsity. As a junior, he played varsity. And he was really good, but still people didn't know how good he was. And then once we all left and he was a senior, he was the best player probably on the West Coast. He was an unbelievable athlete. And sometimes when you would ask him to rise to a different level, that's when he would go in and dunk on a 6'10 or 6'11 player. And when he would do something like that, it would uplift his entire team. And uh, he was a catalyst. Every time I needed to get after the kids to make them rise to a higher level, he was the one that would always lead the charge. He was recruited by just about everyone, but he decided that he was gonna stay home and he was gonna leave Husky basketball to heights it had not been to recently, and that's what he did. Roy defended by Adams this time. Brandon. Oh, he ties it again! He was one of the few at that time that had decided to do that, that had that type of ability. He can shoot it too. Nice pass to Roy, cutting the pass. He drew the foul. When he became a senior here, he was first team All-American. So that just shows you how unselfish and selfless he is to sit and wait his turn to become the star that he became. For him to mature in those four years and watch by his senior year how he had become a phenomenal leader on and off the basketball floor was really, really special. I knew he was good, but I didn't realize how good he was. And we were at a tournament in North Carolina his junior year and Bob Gibbons, who was at the time the number one scouting service in the nation, and he said he's gonna be a big time pro. And I thought, wow, maybe this, maybe he is gonna be special. And he just kept getting better every year. Behind the play of Brandon Roy. Portland wins, game four. The NBA where amazing happens, no doubt about it tonight for Brandon Roy and the Blazers. What a comeback. He always seen the game differently. And there's just some players who just instinctively really understand the big picture, not just his position, but what everybody else was doing. Like we always could come out with the same ending, like the same ending to a story, but how he got to his ending would be totally different than how he got to yours. I would always be interested to see 
which route he took to the end of his story. It was really, really special to have him play for us, to be a part of our program, to help put Washington basketball on the map, and now to always, forever, be listed with uh, one of the greatest uh, athletes to ever play at the University of Washington. It, it's pretty special. Congratulations, Brandon, on your induction into the Husky Hall of Fame. It's a great honor and well-deserved. Ladies and gentlemen, bestowing that purple jacket on our Hall of Famer, Brandon Roy, tonight is his former AAU coach, Lou Hobson. This is a, a really exciting moment for me, and you know I have to be be honest because you know we are we are our family here, and when they they called and said that I was uh, gonna be in the 2018 Hall of Fame, I thought it was a mistake. I was thinking, no, I'm already in the UW Hall of Fame, and they said, no, you got your jersey retired. You're not in the U University of Washington Hall of Fame, so. You know, I thought, okay, oh, well, well that's, well, that's pretty cool. So I started to set my, you know, my sights on, on this night, and it made me think about that night when I did have my jersey retired. And I stood in the, the tunnel over there, and I had my son, who is now 11 years old, and I pointed up at the jersey, and I said, you know, that's your dad's jersey, and it's the number three, and only you can wear that number here one day. And, you know, he was just a little baby, and he smiled, and. And now he's here today, and I'm telling him to be quiet, and he's talking while other people are speaking. And uh, it just shows how, how fast time flies. But um, I was a kid, you know, here growing up in Seattle, Washington, and, you know, I just wanted to play basketball. I watched college football. I watched every college basketball game. And I would always ask my dad a bunch of questions. And I would say, you know, hey, Dad, you know, when I'm playing in college, are you and Mom going to come visit me? And I thought I was going to be playing for North Carolina. And I would always watch every North Carolina game. And, I'm, and my dad said, no. He said, uh, that's too far, too far, son. And um, I said, too far? Well, how far is North Carolina? And he was just like, hey, Brandon, cool it with the questions. If you want to play in front of me and your mom, you have to go to the University of Washington. And I thought, OK, that's doable. But I got to start watching a little more University of Washington games. You know, I only watched the football. <laughs> I watched uh, you know, Mario Bailey, and, and um, I thought I was going to be a football player here at the University of Washington, not a, not a basketball player. But um, as time went on, I got taller, and uh, football wasn't, wasn't quite cut out for me. It was too cold, and I thought, <laughs> I thought hey, why not, um, you know, put on some nice, cool sneakers and, and play ball in front of, a, you know, my mom, my dad in a warm gym. You know, she looked a little too cold when I was, when I was playing football. And... After he told me that, that's what I set my sights on. I set my sights on being a Washington Husky. And, you know, I can honestly say it to this day, I watched Michael Jordan. I never thought I was going to be an NBA player. I thought my cap was going to be being a Washington Husky. And as I developed as a player, that became a realistic goal for me when I got into high school. And I started to get recruited by just about everybody. And my dad came to me and said, you know, hey, Brandon, we got to talk about this, this college deal. You know, where are you thinking about going? I said, that's easy. I'm going to go to the University of Washington. And he said, not so fast. He said, not so fast. He said, as your dad, I got to, you know, make you do your due diligence, and you got to look around at some other options. And I was honest. I said, Dad, I'll look, but I'm going to be a Husky. And I remember hosting, you know, a number of visits. I think uh, Lou Dawson sat in, in my uh, living room, and he said he named off about 10 pros from my position. And my dad looked at me and said, He's going to go to Arizona. He wants to be a pro. And, uh, you know, I smiled, and, and um, Lou left, and me and my dad talked, and he said, well, Brandon, what's the, what's the fuss? I said, Dad, I can be a pro from the University of Washington. And he said, um, if that's going to be your decision, you better make sure you beat the uh, University of Arizona every time you play them. <laughs> and, you know, I can say my, my record was more favorable. I think they, they may have beat us a, a couple times. But um, that was... 
that was my goal. And um, the guy that I committed to was uh, Bob Bender. He was a coach here at the time. And I signed, I committed, I was ready to go. My senior year, I wore Washington Husky socks to, to every game. And then um, after that season, he was fired. And that was hard for me, because for the first time, I, I started to consider you know, wavering. And the reason was, was, you know, I was committed my entire life to playing in front of my parents, playing for my hometown team. And when he was fired, I was like, you know, I think maybe next year we get a group of guys in there, we can help him, and hopefully he can stay. So it was kind of, you know, reality hit me for the first time. And my dad said, let's open back up recruitment. And I was, I was totally fine with that. And then the University of Washington um, hired a guy named Lorenzo Romar. Never heard of him, um, didn't know where he came from, but um, he called my phone one night and he said, I'm the new head coach at the University of Washington and you know, I would like to come visit you and I want you to stay at, our, at the university. And I said, yeah, sure, you know, when do you want to meet? And he said, I'm gonna come up to your school, what time is your lunch? And I'm thinking, no, nah, coach, you can't interrupt my lunch. You know, we, get a, we, we, we only get a, you know, 30, 35 minutes, I don't want to sit down and talk to you at that time. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, no, nah, you know, that's the only time I can make it. So I'm like, all right, cool, come on, come on up. So I came out of class, and he met me by the office, and we talked for about, you know, like I said, 25, 30 minutes. And it was uh, the best conversation, you know, that, that I've ever had with a, with a coach other than, than Lou Hobson. And I remember I got home, my dad got off work, and I said, Dad, guess what, I'm still going to the University of Washington. And he said, well, what happened with opening up this, this recruiting and, 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 and hearing other people out? I said, nope, I met Coach Romar. He's the guy that I have to play for. And as a basketball player, I've always valued, you know, constructive criticism, and I would always give it to myself. And I knew that I was a good player, but I needed to be pushed. And that's what, what Lou Hobson did for me before I met Lorenzo Romar, and I, know I, I, I knew I needed that. When I was a ninth grader, Lou Hobson came to me and he said, your parents can't afford to send you out here on the road and you just be a jackass. Excuse me if the kids are listening. And I was, I was goofing off. I was, I was goofing off and he, he just laid it to me. And I'd never been so embarrassed, but understood how, how honest and how real he was. And I got back off that trip and I promised my mom that I would be the MVP or I would be first team of every tournament that I ever played in. And I can honestly say, to this day, I think I made first team or MVP of, of everything I was ever a part of just because Lou laid it to me straight. So I needed that. Um, Coach Romar, that's what I needed. I needed him to kick my butt. He challenged me every day. My senior year, I was preseason All-American. And he called me in his office, and I can remember it like it was yesterday because it, it really ticked me off. He sat me down, and I didn't make the mile. We had a conditioning thing we had to do every year, and I, I never made it, and I knew I would start, but I was like, you know, Coach, I work myself into shape. That's kind of my deal. And he was like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> so, you know, my senior year, of course, I don't make the mile again. And I'm thinking, it's fine. I'll work my way into shape. I'll be ready to go by the first game. So he calls me in his office, and um, he said, Brandon, we're not going to do that this year. And I'm thinking, hey, you know, what do you mean? What do you need me to do? I'm the captain. I'm the leader. He said, you have to come in and run the mile every morning at 6 a.m. And I said, what? <laughs> and he said, you have to come in and run the mile every morning at 6 a.m. I said, okay, so what time am I going for? He said, you're going for a time that I'm satisfied. And I was like, wait a minute, coach. I don't think I'm going to play for this team much longer. And he said, go home and think about it. And if you show up tomorrow morning, We'll run a mile. And I went home, I called everybody I knew, and I told them, hey, look, I'm gonna transfer, play my last year somewhere else. I just, I'm not gonna do it. You know, this guy isn't gonna just call me out like that. And I fought it all night. I'm telling you, I called all my buddies, and I'm like, nope, I'm, I'm not gonna do it. So I set my alarm anyways, just in case I was gonna do it. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I'm sitting there all morning. I couldn't sleep. I mean, who could sleep knowing that's what they're going into? So, you know, I'm dozing in out of sleep, and, you know, my alarm goes off. And I'm like, darn it, I'm going. So I get in my car, 
I lived in Bellevue. I come across the bridge, and I'm walking in the locker room. I get dressed, and I go out to the track. And I'm thinking, like, you know, hey, coach going to loosen up a little bit. You know, it's early. He, he's thinking about the season. He's thinking about losing me. You know, you're going to be a little more friendlier. And now he was just as firm as, as ever. And he set the time, and I ran it hard. And I did good. And he said, Brandon, you did good. I'm satisfied, but you're not done yet. He said, now you have to satisfy your teammates, so you have to run it again. And I was like, oh, I'm quitting now. This is, <laughs> this is beyond me. So I'm thinking, come on, coach. I just did what you asked me. And he said, yeah, well, now you got to prove it to your teammates. So the next day, all my teammates were standing there, freshmen, sophomores, juniors. What really ticked me off was the freshmen standing there. And they're like, let's go, Brandon, let's go. And I'm thinking, coach, do they have to be here? So, <laughs> you know, no, he's like, uh, no, nah, it's a team. You got to lead them the same way you got to lead the older guys. And I ran it, and he was satisfied. My, my teammates cheered, and, you know, I can honestly say I had the, the best season of my career, not just stats, but um, I felt like as a leader, I felt like that was a year I matured and, and grew into a young man. And, you know, I've always taken those lessons that, that he, he gave me there and I try to take it to my, my professional career. I try to take it to, to being a father. And you know, I've been blessed to have a lot of really, really great women in my life, but also great men. And my mom and my dad, you know, who I'll thank first, they're the ones who put those people around me. And you know, I think that's, that's really important with who you trust with your children. And I was, I was very blessed to, to have parents that, that cared enough and you know, they can read people and, and understand what their kids may need. And it may not be the same for, for every kid. So, you know, mom, I, I, I would like to say thank you. My dad's not, my, not here tonight, he wasn't feeling well, but you know, I love you guys. And you know, I just wouldn't be standing here if it wasn't for, for you two individuals. So I love you guys so much. Um, I have more, more family here, uh, family, friends, kids, and I just want to say that, you know, you guys have been extremely important in my development, you know, from not only being my friend and keeping me out of trouble, but being in the gym with me. You know, I, I was joking with a couple of my buddies. I'm like, do you remember when you used to foul me and, and then yell and say how soft I was? You know, and <laughs> he was, you're soft. How are you going to play against LeBron James like that? I'm like, well, LeBron's not fouling like that. So <laughs> it was, um, it was just, it was good for me. Um, you know, I, being a part of this community, being in the, the Hall of Fame is, it's a really special moment for me. Um, you know, I, I seen Mark Bunnell's jersey next to mine. I'm like, wait a minute, he's getting retired? I mean, he's going to the Hall of Fame tonight? And I was just the biggest, you know, Mark Bunnell fan. I'm thinking, wow, like, me and Mark Bunnell on the same level? It's kind of cool, you know? <laughs> Not saying we are on the same level, but you know, we're, we're all competitors, and this is a guy that, that, I, that I looked up to, and I just thought, I, I honestly couldn't believe it that I was you know, in the same class of, of the Hall of Fame as you, and, and I'm, I'm really honored by that. I mean, like I said, I started watching University of Washington football, and you know, that's why when that drum beats and they waved them hats, that's what, that's what I wanted to be a part of, even though I was a, you know, a basketball player. So it's a um, huge, huge honor to, to be here. You know, I have to admit, uh, Brock, when I was picking up my, my outfit, I didn't know we were going to be twins. <laughs> you look great. So, no, um, there's so many people to thank. Uh, my teammates, I've always said it. I, I feel like I'm, you know, one of many guys that, that should be standing here. Uh, me and Coach Romar joke all the time about, you know, Bobby, Nate, Trey, Will, uh, Mama, Mike Jensen. You know, we, we had a really, really good group of guys. Um, I think that's why Coach Romar lost some hair after us because we we ran them <laughs> I mean we, we we really put them through it but um those four years were, were the best four years of my life I think uh, someone said it earlier you know your senior year you just wanted to slow down you wanted to slow down and you want to just keep enjoying it and um I had a great four years here um I had a good professional career um I had a good couple years of coaching but nothing to ever compare to the to the four years I was here at the University of Washington so Thank everybody here for the, for the great memories and, and all the love. Go Dawgs.
Thank you, Brandon. Congratulations. Welcome to the select company. Our next new Hall of Famer was so dominant in Little League Baseball, the boys got tired of her and said, we don't want you around anymore, which prompted her to go pick up the softball, and the rest is history. She is a self-admitted homebody, so with a lot of offers, she said, I'm coming to you, dub I want to see my family members from British Columbia come down here and watch me perform a lot. Perform she did, leading the Huskies to the 2009 NCAA championship. Hopefully you saw and heard her work in last year's NCAA softball champ as she was working for ESPN in Oklahoma City. Let's learn more now. Let's see it up on the big screen. Our new Husky Hall of Fame inductee, Danielle Laurie. When I hear the name Danielle Laurie, I think of everything that the Husky softball program is about, and that is confidence through preparation. It's mental toughness. It's being a champion. Danielle is probably one of the most mentally tough females, um, if not athletes, that uh, anyone could ever meet. Whatever she sets her mind to, she will do it. That's what is incredibly inspiring off the field uh, in all, all facets of, of everything that we do. She's inspiring as a friend and as a, as a teammate. In her upbringing with uh, mom and dad or wherever it came from, she was a very competitive person. And so she was able to compete in the weight room or in her physical training or whatever it was. And she was one of the few athletes that I've ever been around that can will things to happen and people believe uh, what she says because she was so prepared. The energy and the connection that all of us had, Danielle's a huge part of that. She's obviously one of the best pitchers to ever play the game. You know, she's a workhorse, she leads by example, um, and that was a lot of what 2009 was. The fact that Danielle could pitch so many intense games in a row really trickled down to the rest of the team. I got the chance to play with her, it was really, really special in all aspects of life. The 2009 season, we had our number two pitcher quit that year in September, and Danielle sat down and looked me right in the face and she says, I don't care if she quit. I'm gonna pitch every single inning if you need me to, whatever you need me to do. Sure enough, come May of that season, we were at the NCAA Regional out in UMass. On that championship Sunday, we ended up losing in a pretty big way to get us to an if game, meaning if we lost that game, uh, our season was over. It's late at night, so if we don't win, we don't continue kind of thing. And I, and I believe it was like the 11th inning. Uh, Danielle has kind of been holding it together the whole weekend, the whole season, whatever it wanted to be. And she kind of was having a rough time between innings in the dugout. And not necessarily tears, but she was pretty wore out. And I, I went to her and I said, Danielle, I want you to look down the bullpen. And so she looked behind her to see what was going on in the bullpen. There's nobody warming up. You're going to go back out there next inning and then the inning after that and however long it takes. And we're in the 15th inning and we end up having a lead and Danielle goes in and has to close out the game and throws those last three outs and they were not easy. It was very tough, but he was looking at her, looking back at that video, knowing what she did for us in that 2009 season. That game really said it all. Danielle Lori trying to close the door. Fifty-eight hundred fans in attendance, starting to get on their feet. The pitch on the way, swung out and missed. The Washington Huskies have won the national title in 2009. Just physically, um, the fact that she could do that was incredible. But mentally, I think that was the biggest thing and the reason why we won. You're seeing that more and more. That the mental approach to the game is what separates the good from the great, and there's value in uh, how you look at things and how you compete every day in practice. And she was a great leader for our team the time she was here. And yes, we won the national championship that year, but we would not have been able to do it without Danielle. Danielle, I am so proud of you. Congratulations on your induction into the Husky Hall of Fame. And here to bestow the Purple Hall of Fame jacket on Danielle Laurie tonight is her father, Russ Laurie.
He wouldn't have made it up the stairs. We would have had to call the paramedics. He has a hip surgery coming up here in November, so I told him I'll meet you out front. <laughs> um, wow, I remember getting the call that I was, you know, up for this Hall of Fame, and uh, it was actually just before I was heading to the Women's College World Series. And I have been extremely nervous ever since. And it's funny, you think about the nerves that you'd feel potentially pitching a national championship game. I'd almost rather go back and do that than stand up here in front of all these people. Um, first and foremost, congratulations to everyone that's nominated, or excuse me, I guess not nominated, that is inducted into uh, the Hall of Fame. What a class, and I'm honored and humbled to stand up here with all of you tonight. Um, you know, I, I have to thank my teammates first and foremost. There's a lot of them that are in the room tonight. And I think if you would ask them anything about me, it would be, I just ch chose a tough position that got a lot of the limelight. I did not like the spotlight. I didn't like that a lot of the attention was on me. Um, the most comfortable that I was was when we all stood up here and got our jerseys or excuse me, not jerseys, uh, purple coats as a team, and we had Allie McWhorter up here giving the speech. I'm at my best when I'm with my teammates, so to those that are here tonight supporting me, um, I love you guys so much. You're the reasons why I decided to play this game. Um, and to the ones that couldn't be here, um, go dogs, and I love you guys. We'll always be a special bonded group for sure. Um, A small, you know, just kind of short story on me. For those of you that don't know, I'm a Canadian gal, two hours north in Langley, BC. Um, I didn't know much about this whole US collegiate athlete type situation. I uh, started out playing baseball until I was 13 and got cut from the men's, or I guess they were boys baseball team. Um, and it was solely because I was a woman and I was the best on the team, I will say that. And I was one of the best on the team. Anyways, I ended up getting cut, and my dad sat me down. He said, you know, the world's cruel sometimes, so we just, maybe that wasn't the right path for you to continue, so let's find something that you can pour your energy into. So we chose softball. Um, I started out playing that. I got pretty good. I was fortunate enough to start out with the Canadian national team pretty early at 16. Um, and that's kind of where I started to get noticed to potentially continue my career. Um, how I got recruited to the University of Washington, I was playing uh, with the White Rock Renegades in uh, Canada at this little tournament, and we had heard through the great find that the University of Washington was gonna be making their way to this tournament. They were interested in recruiting me, I was 16. Um, didn't, I mean, I knew a little bit about the program, but like I said, being from Canada, it was just, it's different. And I remember sitting in the stands, it was just kind of one of those moments of, man, are they gonna actually come? Is this just word of mouth? And I saw these, <laughs> these purple people eaters in these costumes walk in, and it was as if you could hear a pin drop. The silence of the crowd and how UW softball was recognized right off the bat, um, it kind of hit home with me. And I remember Heather, and it was Heather and Eve Gaw. Heather had just accepted the University of Washington um, softball job. And I'm proud to say I was her first recruit at the University of Washington. Um, so we were, we were meeting upstairs in the little, you know, bar restaurant area after the game. And she was kind of giving me the lay of the land. You know, we're interested in you. And um, my dad, who was a very competitive, honest man, we were sitting in this, you know, conversation and he's just asking her the hard stuff, the stuff that you can feel where her, like, blood pressure starts to raise a little bit and she's uncomfortable. Eve Goss started taking the answers to the questions a little bit. I'm lucky that I'm standing up here today and she still wanted to recruit me to the University of Washington. But one thing that really stood out for me in that meeting was obviously my dad knew my potential, and he said, hey, you know, if she comes here, she'll potentially need that red shirt year uh, to compete in the 2008 Olympics. But I promise you, if you decide to take my daughter to play at your school, she will help you win a national championship. And he did say that. I remember that. 
The crazy part was that, like I continue to say, being that Canadian gal, you just don't know what a national championship is. You know that the biggest stage is to obviously win. Um, but fast forward three years later, going on my 2008 um, redshirt year, Coach Tar asked me to come to this banquet before I was going to leave with the Canadian team, and I'm there standing in front of 300 people. It seemed easier uh, to do it then than it does now. But I remember standing up in front of all these people and saying, man, it's, I'm really going to miss you guys for this next year. I'm going to be gone. Uh, but I can promise you what I learned from this e Olympic experience, I will bring back and we will win a national championship next year. I promise that. And, you know, Heather afterwards kind of pulls me aside. She goes, Ooh. you know, I, I like that you, you can throw that around, but you understand that there's a lot that goes into that. And, Still to this day, it's easier said than done since we did win, but there was no doubt in my mind that our team, and at that time, that that was something that was not going to be able to happen. Um, Heather, thank you so much for giving this Canadian kid an opportunity to come and represent this amazing university. Um, I'm so proud to be your first recruit. You were a huge reason, obviously, as to why I decided to come here. You've been one of my biggest supporters throughout my career. Um, but I think if I appreciate anything, it's what you are to me now and our friendship that we have now. Um, Lance Glasso, small story, pitching coach at UW. I got the call post-Olympics. Heather called me and she said, you know, uh, I, I think we're going to make a, a little change to the coaching staff. And of course, I trust her regardless of what it was. And I said, OK, what, what are your thoughts? Because I think we're going to get a new pitching coach. And I said, can I make a suggestion? And she goes, sure, what do you got? And I said, is it possible to get a male in the mix? We have way too many females in here. We got to get some male blood, get the competitive spirit a little bit. And she said, we got a good one picked out. And the one thing I remember about Lance is he came into that program post-Olympics for me, put his arms around me and gave me the biggest hug. And he said, I'm here to make you better. Tell me what you need from me and we will go and do the damn thing. He did not come into that program to try to change me. And I can honestly say I was at my lowest of lows post-Olympics, and I do not know if I would have been able to do it without you coming into that program and taking me under your wing um, and helping me get better every single day. So Lance, I love you so much. Thank you for that. JT, thank you for being the funny guy, man. Every team needs one of those. You make us all laugh. The softball team can attest. That's you, I appreciate you. Uh, going into my family, my, my mom, I'll start out with her. She's the easy, kind, <laughs> generous one of the group. I hope that I can pass on to my girls the traits that you've instilled in me. My brother and I's upbringing was crazy, hard, amazing, but there was more hard times than not because of the potential that my dad saw in us. And my mom was there regardless, good or bad. Um, she was there for a shoulder to cry on when, you know, sometimes maybe your dad is a little bit too hard on you because he expects you to be better than you are. Everyone needs a mom like my mom. So mom, thank you for everything you've been to me. Um, I love you. To my dad, I'm not standing up here today without the traits that you instilled in me at an extremely young age. And I am talking, my brother and I are running at a track at four, five, six, seven, learning how to run, learning how to do the hardcore weird things that I can't even think about taking my almost five-year-old to do now. But I'm so thankful that I learned that because I am a strong-ass female that feels like I can conquer the world. And we need more of those. I believe that. So to my father, I'm thankful I stayed the course, even though you did say that I wasn't allowed to date till I was 16, but Brett had multiple girlfriends at 12, 13, 14. It's fine. I stayed the course. I'm thankful for where I'm at. Um, to my brother, man, without you and I continuing that competitive nature that we both had at a young age from who can get the most things in the trash after dinner, to trying to jump up to touch this or that, or who's gonna win, who's gonna get the biggest Slurpee at the end of the day. That's a Canadian thing, not a blizzard. Um, but I mean, I think I'll, I'll stand up here and admit that like you beat me in more things 
then I beat you, but you allowed for me to believe that I can probably beat a lot of guys in a lot of things. So for that, I thank you. <laughs> Lastly, to my husband and to my girls, we'll start out with my husband. Um, he did not get to be around me when I played at the University of Washington. I'm not sure he would have wanted to marry me if he got to see me in this crazy state. Um, he got to see me play competitively a little bit overseas in Japan. Um, but to my husband, thank you for talking me off the ledge a lot. You are definitely the yin to my yang. You can keep me sane. You can keep me grounded. Um, I know that our family right now is going through a lot of things with me trying to go for this 2020 Olympics, and it's hard. And there is a lot that we have to go through in the struggles. But the bigger picture of all of this is if I can potentially try to compete for a medal in 2020 and set an example for my young, for my young girls, I mean, the fact that they could potentially say that mommy was able to do anything means the most to me. So that support from you, I know is hard. We'll get through it. Um, A funny story about when uh, my husband and I first started dating, we were about two months in, and I said, all right, it's time to have the talk. He was over in Venezuela playing professional baseball, and I uh, called him and I said, you know, I gotta, I gotta get something off my chest. If this relationship gets any more serious, I need you to know that like, if this is gonna work, I'm gonna live by the University of Washington. That's where I wanna hang my hat. He is a Boston boy. His mom and dad flew in from Boston to be here tonight. It's hard to get him here from Boston, but I remember saying, I wanna raise a family where I've felt the most comfortable in my whole life. I wanna bring my girls to softball games. I wanna bring them to basketball games. I want them to be around this atmosphere because I was not around that growing up. And I see how much it's impacted my life and I want it to impact theirs. So to Andrew, thank you for being my support. To my little ladies, you've made my life incredibly hard. <laughs> But, but always remember, mommy loves you. There's a reason to my madness. I will have more of papa's traits than grandma's, and that's okay. Daddy will take on grandma's traits. <laughs> but know that mommy will always be the light at the end of the tunnel for you, and I will always have your best interests at heart, and I love you and Audrey so, so much. Um, Lastly, a couple things to all my support system in the stands. I mean, my hat, I have my pitching coach here from 17 years ago. I mean, I have four tables of the closest people to me in my whole life that have seen me at my highest highs and my lowest lows. My love for you is, I, I can't even describe it. So to share this moment with you all um, means the world to me. Lastly, to UW softball that's here tonight, Obviously, you girls mean more to me than you will ever know. And if I could pass on any advice to you guys, what I've learned as a mom is that your kids grow up like that, and I truly believe that four years goes by way too quick. So when I say love your teammates, be selfish in your work ethic, and truly find a way to get better every single day because you don't want to wake up in your last year and go, what's my legacy? What, what, what do I want to leave at this program before it's too late? So find a way to be as good as you can be every single day through the grind, even when it sucks, because you guys have the ability to win a championship, especially after how you guys were last year. Um, I'm always here for you. Heather has my number. She can pass it on to you all. University of Washington, thank you for everything you've been to me. Um, Thank you, everyone. Go dogs. When Danielle and I spoke earlier this week, I said, just imagine you're in the pitching circle up here. I think she just struck out the side. What do you think? Good luck in your Olympic pursuit. We'll be cheering you on. In 1990, I was roving the football sidelines for UW Radio, and the first road game was at Purdue. It was National Pork Day in West Lafayette, Indiana. Two things I remember about that game one, I only had a 100-foot cable, so I could not get to Coach James to do the halftime interview. 
I was blocked off by the Boiler Babes, the cheer staff for Purdue. The other thing I remember, our young left-handed quarterback went out, and somehow he wanted to take the snap from under the guard instead of the center. Well, he got things right from there, and uh, along the way became the most outstanding player of the Rose Bowl. And for a Southern California kid, that's pretty good stuff. He learned the lessons of a lot of great coaches, including the dog father here. He's now a high school football coach in Florida and passing on a lot of those lessons. Our final inductee tonight in the 2018 Husky Hall of Fame class, Mark Brunell. Mark came to the University of Washington as a leader. He was definitely the leader of our freshman class. He was leading our scout team. He was making us go watch film. He was a leader from the first time he stepped foot in the University of Washington. He was a supreme athlete who also worked really hard, fit in with the guys, um, and you know, there sometimes can be a little bit of an air to a quarterback. Mark just didn't have that. Yeah, you can be the greatest quarterback in the world, but if you're not mentally and physically tough, and you're not a great competitor, you don't have a chance to, for greatness. Well, he had all three of those, and I think those were even developed more when he came to University of Washington. You know, he really wanted to be a great player, and there's a tradition of quarterbacks uh, that the Huskies have, and he was certainly a part of that. He leads by example, number one, but he's very well respected by his teammates, and all these things as a quarterback are necessary, you know, to, to earn the trust uh, in your teammates and staff. I haven't mentioned anything about his ability. He was as fast as a running back. He could still throw as well as the other guys, but Immediately you just saw that this was a little different athlete playing the position. But the one thing that really added to all that, that magnified his abilities, was his ability to run and his quickness. We really used that right away. We started doing a lot more things with him in that first year. His ability to be able to make plays with his feet, he caused nightmares for defenses. So he had a lot of skills and uh, the neat thing about him, he always worked hard to perfect him. Anytime he played against Mark Brunell, you had to have a plan for who's going to be responsible for him if he decides to leave that backfield. It was a weapon. That class really was sort of the kickstart for what was just a great run of three or four seasons. Steve Entman, Lincoln Kennedy, Mario Bailey. I have a special bond with him. Um, I, think I, I think I got his first touchdown pass. I'm pretty sure of it. And people never remember, since they know Billy was one of our quarterbacks, that Mark is the one. Every time he came in the game, I know he would look for me. It's a special bond. I even think we have a flag outside together. My favorite story of Mark, we had won the Rose Bowl. We beat Iowa. I think we finished about fifth in the country. And we were clear number one, and Mark got hurt and uh, blew out his knee in, in spring training. Uh, when we first heard about the injury, I kept hearing that he's not going to be able to play again. But knowing Mark and his parents and where he's from, we all knew that he was going to come back. We just didn't know if he was going to come back and be the same type of Mark Brunel that he previous was. It was a dark time because Billy Joe Hobart hadn't emerged. No one really knew what he could do at the time. But watching him and go through it in the off season, during the season, and then come back to play was one of the most remarkable things you could see. It was amazing when he ran on that field. We wanted to make sure that he felt a part of our team, and he was a big part in trying to motivate us and keep us on track to win the national championship. Mark was the quarterback he had been in the previous Rose Bowl, and then of course he had the next year against Michigan, one of the greatest Rose Bowl performances of all time. Mark Brunel would have been a Heisman Trophy candidate, but there are no mistakes, and I know that Mark's NFL career and what he went through has made him an even more special person than he already was. I, th I think when you're around him, he builds up confidence without question. I'm sure they saw this guy and they, they could figure out real quick too that he was going to be a great player and raise the attention of everybody on that team uh, to a different level. You have to be really, really a good, talented player to do what he did. And uh, I think that was very revealing. Congratulations, Mark, on being inducted into the Husky Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, bestowing the purple Husky Hall of Fame jacket on Mark Brunell tonight is his father, Dave Brunell. All right. Thank you very much. 
Folks, you got one more in you? One more? All right, give me six minutes and we'll be out of here, okay? Thank you so much. This is certainly one of the most memorable uh, moments of my life, honestly. This is not just an award. This is special. This is special to me. This is special to my family. And uh, it means so much to be a part of the Husky Hall of Fame. Uh, and I will cherish this absolutely forever. I'm a, proud to be a part of this incredible class. Um, I want to thank um, our athletic director, Jennifer Cohen, and the selection committee uh, for allowing us to be a part of this class. And uh, it is very special. Thank you so much. It's great to see some familiar faces, so good to see some former teammates. Uh, I have to admit, seeing these guys brings back some, some old feelings. In fact, I was just sitting back there with Todd Bridge and Dave Hoffman, my roommates in college, and we're still cracking the same jokes as we were 30 years ago. Um, it's so good to see them. Um, actually, tonight we have some of the greatest Huskies, Husky football players that have ever played uh, for the purple and gold. Um, Mario Bailey, I was fortunate to catch up with him sitting at my table tonight. Actually, I was sitting at his table tonight, to tell you the truth. Um, and honestly, you know, as quarterbacks, you just, you have game plans going into every game. And actually, mine was pretty simple. I knew that if we wanted to win a football game, all I had to do was throw it to number five, Mario Bailey. It was really that simple. It really was that simple. Um, to get a chance to catch up with him tonight, one of the Husky greats and absolutely uh, incredible receiver for the Huskies. Um, so many great, more, so many great memories. Um, on the other side of the ball, we were all fortunate to have Dave Hoffman playing linebacker uh, for the for the Washington Huskies. Um, actually, I had a game plan for Dave Hoffman before the game too. All I had to do was avoid him because if I saw him before the game on the field, Dave was going to try to headbutt me. And, uh, and that's something that you do not want to experience before a game. He just felt like it was something that he needed to do to get me ready. But I was a quarterback. I didn't need a headbutt before a game. But that was Hoff Daddy. That was Hoff Daddy. Uh, another Husky great, of course. And uh, remains to be such a great, such a great friend. Um, and of course, one of the great Husky quarterbacks here tonight is uh, Damon Heward, who did remarkable things on the field and continues to do remarkable things off the field for the Huskies. Um, even to this day. I've learned so much about the, the game of football um, as a quarterback. Honestly, the greatest lesson you learn is simply how dependent you are on your teammates. Uh, a quarterback, honestly, can really do nothing without good people around him, and it is so true in life as well. And I'm so f very grateful uh, for the people in my life that's got, that, that God has uh, put in my life and this honor tonight is, is really about all of them. My family, my friends, my teammates. This is as much about you as it is about me. And I'm thankful and so appreciative of all the people that I got to play with, that I was allowed to be surrounded by, coaches, players, and of course, friends. Um, I want to start by thanking my parents, Dave and Sharon Brunel. Uh, for their unconditional love throughout my life. They have always, always supported me uh, and, have and have encouraged me to be my best, whether it's in the, on the field, uh, in the classroom. They've been absolutely amazing. They taught me the importance of faith, treating others with respect, the importance of working hard on the field, and of course, in the classroom. My parents were always there for me and my brother, Matt. And I can remember my dad, this is a true story, my dad would drive up 17 hours from Southern California just to watch two practices, two practices. And I, I thought he was crazy. I didn't quite understand it. Honestly, dad, I didn't quite understand it to, until I became a dad. And now I completely get it. Uh, my dad and my, my mom were always supportive and uh, uh, huge Husky fans and I'm, I am forever grateful. Um, they have been my role models throughout my life and my parents to this day are certainly my heroes. And of course, my brother Matt, thank you for always being there. I hope you know what a joy it was to grow up with you, buddy. Uh, I also wanna thank uh, my, the, the absolute number one Husky fan that I have ever met in my life, um, my wife, Stacy. Um, who would have ever thought 
that that cute little track athlete running around Husky Stadium um, would turn out to be the love of my life. And I still rem remember watching her run around the track as she practiced cross country and track and completely forgetting what play I had just called in the huddle. And that is absolutely true. You talk about distractions. Coach James did not like that at all, but I never told him it was because of the, the cute little brunette over there. Um, and of course, after stalking her for a, for a, a couple months uh, on campus, I finally had the courage to, uh, to meet her. You need to talk about romantic folks. Now, I actually met my wife, Stacy. We've been married 26 years now. We have four children. We actually met at the leg extension machine in the weight room. Now, if that's not husky, I don't know what is husky. That is romantic. I did stalk her for a couple months. I was a little intimidated. Um, of course, uh, Dave Hoffman and uh, Todd Bridge would tell you that after I met Stacy, that was it, man. I was absolutely done. Um, Stacy, you are the best thing that has absolutely ever happened to me. And I don't have the time uh, to express how much you mean to me and how grateful I am that you um, are my wife and I get to be your husband. Thank you, number one Husky fan. I appreciate you. I also want to thank uh, my father-in-law and my mother-in-law as well, Joe and Sherry Leipzak. Uh, it wasn't easy having your family in Southern California a thousand miles away. Uh, you were always there for me. You immediately uh, uh, allowed me to be part of your family. Um, the countless uh, visits out to Beaver Lake were some of the best memories I have of college. And I will never forget how you took care of me after my knee injury, after my sophomore year. Um, those trips out to, out to your house were amazing. I apologize that perhaps I brought too many teammates out there at times, but um, you were wonderful people. And as I said, you've always been there for me. You're an inspiration to me, Granny, Mags, and Teen. It has been absolutely the, uh, a joy to watch you grow up and be a part of your life. So thank you so very much. I love you all so very much. I want to thank my babies, my children. I guess that it is only fitting that uh, our first, uh, Caitlin, uh, was born right across the street from Husky Stadium at University Hospital. Only fitting, right? And um, I just want you to know uh, that I am so proud of all of you. And you are, for, for your mom and I, you are the joy of our lives. We love you so much and are so proud of you. Um, I also want to thank Coach James. Um, and his staff for allowing me to be part of the Husky family. You know, they took a chance on a kid from, a, from a, an obscure high school in a small uh, town in, in, uh, in California. Um, I can actually remember being so surprised that Coach James in the University of Washington was actually interested in me. Um, and who would have thought that by him being interested, it would have set my, this would have set my life on a course that I am forever grateful for. The most important decisions I ever made, I made while I was a Husky at the University of Washington. You know, I played for, a, I played a lot of games in my career, in college, and then uh, in the pros. Um, and I've been nervous, honestly, for every one of them. I was just one of those guys that for football games, I just got nervous. I had to be nervous a little bit, uh, or just something wasn't quite right. That's just the way I got ready. But I've, the most nervous, I've ever been in my life was, in, was when I was 17 years old and Don James actually walked into my house in Southern California and offered me a scholarship. I absolutely couldn't believe it. And to think about it right now, I still have chills. What an honor, what a privilege. My journey began that moment when he walked into my house and my, my dad would certainly remember that. It was absolutely the thrill of my lifetime and who would have thought how things would have turned out so grateful for him um, and the impact that he made on my life. What an incredible coach, but more important, what an absolute incredible person, um, and I'm forever grateful for him. As I said earlier, <clears throat> as I said earlier, a quarterback is really nothing without the, his teammates around him. I am grateful that I was surrounded by so many talented football players. Uh, even, more thank, even more important, I'm thankful for being surrounded by such great people. I will always remember the great memories that we had on the field, the big wins, beating USC at home in 1990, uh, the Rose Bowls, the national championship, 
um, getting a chance on the field to see Mario Bailey's Heisman pose. You talk about a moment now. You talk about a great moment. I am up here because of Mario Bailey. I am up here because of Dave Hoffman. I'm up here because of guys like that. I am so thankful. I am absolutely so thankful and so grateful that uh, I was fortunate enough to play with these guys. And I will cherish even more, even more than the great players and what we did on the field. Uh, I'm so thankful for the friendships that I, that I made. My roommates, Todd Bridge, uh, Orlando McKay, David Hoffman, uh, you actually have no idea what you all mean to me, and I will forever cherish the times that we have. I think about you guys often. I want to thank my coaches. Uh, the list of coaches that made an impact on me goes on and on. At the top of the list, of course, I mentioned Coach James. Uh, I learned discipline, accountability, and hard work. Things, lessons that just didn't stop it when I got done being uh, at the University of Washington. Things that, that continued and will continue for the rest of my life, and things that I pass on to my own, to my own children. I learned from Coach James. Uh, I'm thankful for, the, for Chris Tormey, who recruited me, uh, Gary Pinkle, who you saw up there, who taught me so much about the game of football and playing quarterback, but actually made me believe that I actually could be a good college quarterback. I'm thankful for Keith Gilbertson, uh, who taught me about offense and game planning who taught me that you could actually work really hard and have a great time doing it. I love playing for Coach Gilbertson. Uh, he made me laugh and he made me work and was such an inspiration to me as a player. Again, forever grateful. Without these guys, my football career ends after the University of Washington and there is no doubt. I'm thankful to my teammates. I'm thankful for my coaches. In closing, I also wanna, I, I wanna thank again, uh, Jen Cohen. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, this incredible honor. Thank you to the selection committee. This is a wonderful night for me and my family. Uh, I will certainly remember this night for the rest of my life. Um, thank you to, uh, congratulations to the ender, other inductees. It actually, it absolutely is a privilege to be in the same class as you. Being a Husky is one of the greatest joys of my life. I will forever be a Husky. Thank you for this night. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the opportunity for me to share in this evening with you. Go Ducks. Before we wrap it up tonight, I wanna to have all of our new Hall of Famers come up on stage at the same time to have a picture taken as a group. Again, we would like to thank everybody who made this Husky Hall of Fame ceremony possible, our sponsors, certainly Aqua, and the great meal that they provided tonight. Remember, you can bring home memories of the 2018 Husky Hall of Fame ceremony with a DVD produced by UW TV. You'll see all of the videos and athlete speeches from tonight's event. Other forms are available in the reception area or online at uwtv.org. Now let's welcome back all of our new 2018 class Husky Hall of Fame.